Sound wonderful as always. Thank you, Jeff. Well, the word's good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. Before we pray and uh, get into what we're sharing today, I want to obey my heart on something. So, you know, Reverend Julie, when she stepped here during offering, she mentioned how, you know, a lot of churches... Well, the lady she was talking to said, they, you know, they don't want to talk about money because people leave. And, and I've certainly seen that over the years. It's, it's probably the number one reason people leave this church. But what's interesting is you have just as many here that say God changed their life by them hearing the word on finances and doing it. And so I want to just encourage you and warn you, be careful before you get offended at anything that's in the Bible. Because what's in the Bible is God's thoughts. What's in the Bible is God's will. And if God put over 2,000 scriptures in the word, he's trying to get across to us that he wants us to know a little bit about what to do with our money. You know, I had this happen years ago when we were in the storefront still. There was a whole family that was coming and there was a lot of kids and there was, there was a grandma, there was aunts and uncles and mom, dad, and just, just a whole family. And they all wrote me individual letters, uh, handwritten letters. And it was one of the sweetest things I've ever experienced in ministry. And in each of the, the letters were telling me how blessed they were since they started coming to the church and, and what God has done for them. And, and it, it just, I had tears reading it, you know, kids writing letters and people, you know, lives change and kids get hungry for God and things. Well, they had gone away, you know, and, and uh, a family thing and had come back and they were in service one Sunday. And, and, and then after that service, I hadn't seen them in, in almost a month. And so I reached out, you know, not to be nosy or, you know, where are you, but just, is everything okay, you know, and, and I reached out, and, and they said, uh, you know, we're not coming anymore, I thought, man, that, that's really weird, you know, wasn't, wasn't two months ago, I got these letters, you know, that, that I kept, and they said, when we came back from being away on our family thing, they said, you, you, t you were talking about church attendance, and they said, when you're talking about being faithful in church, you looked right at us when you said it, and I know that you were, you were upset with us that we weren't there uh, for, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't in service that week. And I thought, well, first of all, if you were in the storefront, there was really nowhere else for me to look. It was really small. You know, I had to look at somebody. And I thought, you know, what they went away for was a family emergency. And I thought, man, that, that's not true. They know that's not true. Because actually what they went for a family thing, they went, I actually helped support them and bless them with it. And that, I don't judge people when they miss church or treat them different when they, when they come back. I, I love everybody the same, you know. And, but anyways, that wasn't true. But while we were talking, the Holy Spirit said to me, she's lying to you. The reason they're not coming back anymore is because, and this is what the Holy Ghost said, they can't stand that you talk about tithing. So I was talking to her on the phone. And I said, I said let's, just, let's just be honest. Don't lie to me. I said, you're not coming back anymore. I said, because you can't stand that I talk about tithing. And you know what her response was? I was so thankful she didn't lie. She said, you're right, Pastor. I can't stand it. Well, God, God located her, amen. Well, here's the thing is they were struggling financially. Like, I'm talking poverty levels. Well, God doesn't want us to stay in poverty. In fact, Jesus said the gospel will help the poor to be not poor anymore. He says the answer to the poor is the word of God. You want your finances changed? And so many people here would say, you know what? I came into this place one way. God showed me what to do. I did what God said to do, not what the preacher said to do. What did the word say to do? I did what the word said to do financially, and it supernaturally changed my life. So you can get offended, and you can leave and get all mad, but you're going to miss out on something. Well, months had went by, and I got a, I got a speeding ticket. Actually, I actually got a speeding ticket on the way to Wednesday night church. I get real awkward when I'm around the police. Like, I get all nervous and... He asked me if I had my license and registration, and I said, I didn't, you know, I couldn't find it. I had my license and my registration, and so he went back to his car, and I'm digging around my glove box, and I found my registration, and I got so excited to help him, he's in his car, and I jumped out, waving my arm, and said, sir, get back in your car, because I'm jumping out, I got it, I got it, he probably thinks I'm getting ready to do something, you know, but I was just happy to help, you know, it got awkward, I said, oh, okay, I'll get back in my car. Well, I got a speeding ticket, and when I went to court to take care of that speeding ticket, that woman was there. And I was in the back, you know, and so this months had gone by. And it's kind of humorous, you know, she gets up there and the police officer says, I don't, or the, the judge says, I don't understand this, how this is even possible. But the police officer has it written in the report here that he pulled you over because when he, when you passed him, you had both 
Both. Both hands in the chips and dip. That's what the judge said out loud. And I'll tell you how embarrassing, right? But it was so funny. Like, the thought of that. Both hands. Where was no hand on the steering wheel? Probably doing one of these knee things, you know. And, but uh, anyways, that was said. But you know what went on to be said? Is when she's trying to get out of it, she starts to talk about how bad her life has been. How, how poor they are. How I can't afford a ticket. And, this, and I'm thinking the whole time my heart's breaking. Like, God was trying to help you through the word, but you got offended. It'd be one thing if there's nothing to back it up. If the preacher's getting up here and manipulating money. But if it's in the word of God, you want what God has said. That was their help. Amen. That was their help. And people hear it and bam. So many. The, the, you know how this church should be quadruple the size on just people that have left because I won't shut up about money. That's true. We've had, we had, one time I counted, this was two years ago, I counted over 50 people that, that were with me for over two years that the reason they ended up leaving me is because I won't shut up about money. I'm not going to shut up about money because Jesus didn't shut up about money. God didn't shut up about money. And I want to encourage you, don't get offended by it. If it's in the Bible, renew your mind, do what the Word says, and watch what happens. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word this morning. It's our help. It's our answer. Thank you that you're going to speak to us. Father, I thank you that when I open my mouth, you'll fill it with words from heaven. Father, I thank you all hit bullseyes in people's hearts. And what I mean by that is, Father, I'm going to say things that are so specific and pertinent to their circumstances, to their situation in life, that, Father, they, can't, they won't be able to deny it. Things that I know nothing about, things that I've never even heard uh, that they're going through. People I don't even know, you're going to say things to them, Father, that are so specific because you love them and this is their help. So, Father, thank you for boldness this morning. Thank you for utterance. We thank you for where we're going, where this message is going to take us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Genesis chapter 8, I'm going to read this real quick. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these two verses, but just to kind of set the tone for where we've been for the last, oh, it's probably going on a month or a little more now. But in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22, we see that the, the word of God says this, that while the earth remaineth, that means as long as there's a planet earth and human beings occupying it, this is going to be a, a, a forever law, a forever thing. He says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, day and night shall not cease. Well, we're not looking at, 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 at the day and night. We're not looking at uh, summer and winter and cold and heat. We're looking at the one thing that he said in there, which is while the earth remains, something is going to exist here. It's going to be called seed time and harvest, or another way of saying it is sowing and reaping. And how many of you know in this community, agriculture community, and people that have gardens and farming, we understand and know that that's true, right? That farmers every single year are banking on this law, this, this spiritual principle, this natural thing that God's put forth, that it works, right? They, they, they go out, plow their fields, know that if I do the right thing, put the right stuff down, plant the right thing, I know that sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest is going to work. And they take advantage of that, don't they? they? They know it works. They know it's true. And here's the thing. Even if you aren't a farmer, even if you aren't a gardener, you know it's true. Pretty soon we're going to see the fields uh, are going to be sprung up with corn, amen, <laughs> from seed time and harvest. And you can be a seed time and harvest denier. You can be a seed time and harvest ignorer. But the principle's true, whether you're applying it or not, whether you believe it or not, it's true. And so we see that, that God says that's going to be in, intact. But not all of us have gardens. Not all of us have farm, uh, farms and, and fields to, to, to plant things. And so does that, are we exempt then from this seed time and harvest? Well, we're not. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, and this verse is such a revelation. This verse should be so eye-opening to people uh, going forward. And in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, it says this, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What's that mean? Whatever God says is true is true. Amen? Don't think that you can get something different than what God has said. You know, the Bible talks about, in Matthew chapter 9, it talks about what it looks like in a person's life when they don't have a pastor. It says they're like sheep without a shepherd, and he goes on to use different words. He, he says they're, they're, they're scattered and faint. A more modern translation would say it this way. They're de dejected, harassed, bewildered, distressed, helpless. That's what a regular natural sheep would be without a shepherd, and the spiritual sheep is the pastor, and the, uh, the spiritual shepherd is the pastor, the spiritual sheep are the people. And Jesus said if people don't have a shepherd, that's what their life's going to look like. And so many times I've had people come to me 
Life is hell on earth. And I'll tell you, the first thing you need to do is plant in church and get a pastor. Because you can't get God's help apart from what God says is the way he's going to help you. Yeah. And so many people don't want, to, don't want to avail themselves to something like that or money, whatever God says about money, or what God says about holiness, or what God says about walking in love. And they want the blessings anyways. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever he says is going to come to pass. And so he says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, not farm, not just corn, not just whatever, whatsoever a man soweth, that is what he's going to reap. And we know that she, she talked about Luke 6 today, uh, and she talked about the financial way where the God says, if you give, it'll come back to you, sowing and reaping. But if you look at the verses before, it's not just gardening, gardening it's not just farming, it's not just money. He says, he that sows judgment is going to receive judgment. He that sows unforgiveness will reap unforgiveness. This seed time and harvest, this sowing and reaping, it is a principle that as long as we are on the earth is going to be in play, and it goes for everything, whatsoever a man sows. You sow love, you'll receive love. You sow condemnation, you'll receive condemnation. You sow judgment, you'll receive judgment. You sow money, you'll reap money. It just works. He says it works. Praise God. And so we've been looking at that, that my goodness, it ought to wake us up to realize that our future are empty fields ready for a harvest. Are they going to be a harvest of weeds and prickers and red brush and thorns and thistles, poison ivy? Or is it going to be a, a, a flourishing harvest of blessing that God says? Well, how your life turns out has more to do with you than it does God. When, when a, farmer, a farmer doesn't say, boy, I sure hope God gives me corn this year. No, the farmer sets his sights to and intends to plant corn to get corn. Amen? He's not surprised by it. You want blessings? You've got to sow a certain way. You want change? You've got to sow a certain way. And so that's what we've been looking at. And in the process of time we've got up to this point, we've been looking at that our words are like seeds. Amen? And faith words are things that will produce for us. We saw that. You can look at the, the previous messages. We're going to hit more on that today because we're not done with it yet. And, and the thing is, though, just like seed time and harvest, you can plant wrong things and grow wrong things and things that aren't blessings and aren't helpful. And you can plant good things and reap good things. It's the same thing with your words. You can have belief words that are wrong to produce wrong harvests, and belief words that are right to produce right harvests. Amen. And so that's what we're looking at here today. And so I'm going to get to a, a point at the end of the, uh, end of the service. But before we get to what I want to get to, I need to roll out the red carpet and lay the foundation so that when we get to that point, your mind's renewed, your eyes are open to say, okay, if that's what God says, that's what God means. That, that's what's available to us. And let me just, just tell you this this morning. And I speak it out in the internet land too. There is such a religious mindset and a, a blanket, a yoke of the devil in the body of Christ and in Christian churches. And the mindset is this, that God is going to do whatever God wants to do. That God is sovereign and we can't control what happens. If God wants to bless us, I guess it was our lucky day. If God does it, well, he's got more important things to do. And I'm telling you, that mindset is rampant in the body of Christ. How do I know? I grew up in those churches. Many of you grew up in that, those churches. And many of my family and friends are still in those churches. And you know what that men mentality, that mindset does? It gets people, the body of Christ, Christians, to sit on their hands and do nothing and just wait. And then when God doesn't do it, what happens? We get discouraged at God and we start blaming God. God, where are you? Don't you love me? Why aren't you helping me? Well, see, that's a backwards mentality. That's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, you know what the Bible teaches about your God? You know what he's doing 24-7, 365 in our natural time frame? He says, I'm looking to and fro over the whole earth. I'm looking for somebody. I can show myself in all my goodness, all my blessings. I'm looking for someone. I can show myself strong on their behalf. That's what your father's doing. He's not the, the carrot dangler, the blessing dangler. Oh, no, 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 I don't want, no, no, no. He wants to bless you. But see, 
Here's what the, the word teaches, but, the, but the, the body of Christ in a lot of places and the world doesn't teach. God has a part. No doubt God has a part. But you know what God's part was? Jesus on the cross. The blessings, the promises that come through him. And you know what Jesus said on the cross? Three words that you need to get ingrained in your mind from his, from his, from his standpoint. It is finished. What's he saying? I'm done. I did everything I need to do for them. It's finished. Now, see, here's what you have to understand. That's God's part. But see, then what, the, what people are ignorant of and don't know is that man has a part then. To do what? Cooperate with what God has said. And then when man cooperates with what God has said, it unties God's hands to do and be faithful and true to what God said he will do for you doing your part. But see, the body of Christ doesn't know about their part. The body of Christ just sits around waiting for God to do it. And then when God's not doing it, God's sitting around in the throne waiting for us to do something. Right. Waiting for us to cooperate so then he can bombard us with those blessings. And you need to know that. And so I want to look at some scriptures, because don't take my word for it. I want to look at some scriptures here this morning. Before we get to the point that I want to make today and drive home to you, I want to show you verses in the Bible, very important things that are clear that you have a part, and that without your part, you don't get what God has said. Amen? Amen? Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Let's start right off at the, at, the, at the starting line. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. Think about the, the greatest subject of all, salvation. Getting to go to heaven. Not dying, going to hell. Receiving, receiving that gift, that mercy. That's a starting gate. That's a starting line. Once we receive that, we're in the family then. We're a child of God. We have access to all the promises of God. But even that promise, God did something. What? Put Jesus on the cross. Jesus obeyed, submitted, and went to the cross and took our sins. But look what it says here. That if, everybody say if. That means it might happen, it might not happen. Now what's the next word after if? Thou. You know what that word thou means in the King James? You. It doesn't say anything about Jesus there, what he needs to do. It doesn't say anything about what God needs to do. It says that if you, you will confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. So the end of that verse says you shall be saved. But how do you get to the part that you shall be saved? It doesn't come without you first doing something. You had to do something. You had to confess it. You had to believe it. Amen. Go with me to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. See, you need to have this ingrained in you so when we get to the end tonight, this morning, you're going to see, okay, i got to make some changes. i got to do this because this is what God has said. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. Now, the end result of this verse, look at the, look at the, last, uh, the last two lines there after the comma. Or no, actually, we'll go, we'll go to the, the third line up. It says, you shall make your way prosperous... And then you shall have good success. Just like the last verse says, and thou shalt be saved. We want to get to the thou shalt be saved, but you got to do some things first. Well, there it says that prosperity and good success are a possibility for you. That God is offering you prosperity and good success. Who doesn't want prosperity and good success? I want that. Amen? Okay, well, let's look at then, because if you think about prosperity and good success, and you were to ask the majority of the body of Christ, well, if God wants to do it, he'll do it. And if God does it, he won't. But that's not true. Look at how we get to prosperity and good success. Now, I want you to see this, and I'm going to be redundant and really beat, beat the dead horse here and really go after this. I'm going to show you how much you're mentioned here, and then let's see how much Jesus is mentioned and how much God is mentioned to get to prosperity and good success. This book of the law, the word of God, now look at this, shall not depart out of whose mouth? Thy mouth. That's your mouth. You're mentioned one time there. But... You, there you are again, mentioned again, something you have to do, but you shall meditate on the word of God day and night. Now look at this. That you, third time you're mentioned, that you mayest observe to do according to all that is written then, for then you 
shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Six times you're talked about in what you have to do. The word can't depart out of your mouth. You have to meditate. You have to observe to do it. For then you're making your own way prosperous. What was God's part in this? He gave you the word. Now what's your part? Do the right thing with the word. And what's the end result? Prosperity and good success. But people are sitting around. God bless me. God bless me. God bless me. Boo hooing. That's not how you get God's blessings. I heard Pastor Nancy Dufresne say this years ago, and it stuck with me, and it's one of those moments in life that's like an eye-opener and, and like a mile marker, like, 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 like one of those things you look back on, a landmark. And she said this. She said, we have to be skillful with God's Word. How many times people just show up, sit there in one ear and out the other, walk out, bless me, God. That's not... See, you know what this verse is? When you do this verse, you know what it is? It's being skillful with what God said to do. Amen. You got to be skillful with it. Well, go with me to Matthew 18 and verse 18. What am I doing? I'm hammering home a point and a truth about we have a part to play. Matthew 18 and verse 18. It says... This is Jesus talking. Verily I say unto, who is he talking to? You. There it is again. Whatsoever you, everybody say me. Whatsoever you shall bind. Now look what he says here. On the earth. Who's it start with? Us whatsoever you shall bind on earth. See, we're always thinking, God, come on. Bind this poverty that's running rampant in my life. God, bind this enemy that's coming against me. God, bind this sickness that's ravaging my body. Bind it, Lord. What's the bind mean? Stop it to, to, to take control of that. And that's how it works. Whatsoever you bind on the earth, what does he say? Shall then be bound in heaven. What's heaven waiting for? You. Whatsoever you shall loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. Come on, loose prosperity on my life. Please loose and let, and let, let the, the, the waves and the wind of healing just overtake me. Loose that on me, Lord. No, 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 no. Whatsoever you loose, heaven will loose. Do you see that there? There it is. Heaven waiting for you to do something, but body of Christ sitting around saying, bind things, loose things for me. No, no, no. And God's saying, come on. Be skillful with my word. Yeah. Praise God. Go to Mark 9.23. I'm just, I'm just barely scratching the surface here on this stuff. See, you need to know something. Once you get born again, you didn't get born again by your works. Now you, you, had, to, you had to get saved by, by believing, but it wasn't by works. But once you get saved, you know what Christianity is? It's a life of works. Yeah. Oh, blasphemy. No, no, no. Meditating in the word is a work. Speaking the word is a work. Day and night is a work. Amen. Binding is a work. Loosing is a work. It's all based on works and what you do and don't do. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. Look at this. Jesus said unto him, if you, what's he do? He takes the onus off of himself and says, if you, if you, talking to the person, can believe. He said, if you can have faith, all things are possible to him, the person that chooses to be in faith. Wait a minute. These things that are impossible, God, do it. God, do it. Come on, God, do it. The doctor's saying it's incurable. The paycheck's saying it's impossible. Come on, do something. And you know what the Lord's saying? All things are possible. See, it's not on his end. Your sickness and disease, easy peasy for him. The person that's coming against you and the enemies and, the, and the, 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 the attacks, easy for him. Easy for him. The financial problem you're in, he's got the answer. It's so easy. All things are already possible to him. But he's saying, but how are we going to get that all things possible? Up to us. If we can believe. You know what the vice versa of that would be? If you can't believe, all things are not possible. If your faith struggles, all things are not possible for you. 
Well, there he is again. Jesus said, don't look at me. I've already told you it's available to you. God's already said my promises are yes and amen. God already told us if you can believe, you can have it. It's up to you now. Oh, how the body of Christ is duped. Oh, and you know why? That's why people leave we talk about money. Because you grew up in churches where they don't talk about it. But you know what I grew up in? Churches that didn't talk about it and a whole lot of broke people. No testimonies of thousands of dollars being sent by somebody. She didn't even tell you. It had been years since she even spoke to this person. Years. This person had no idea. But God did. Because, see, when you do God's word and put supernatural on it, and then, then the reaction has to come back to you good because God's not a liar. Amen. But, see, it's so foreign to people. I one time pre preached at a Baptist church. Nothing against Baptist churches. This was just this Baptist church. I was asked to preach at a Baptist church. And actually, it was in Cattaraugus County. It was years ago. And you know what I got up there and preached about? God's goodness. I said, God's not the, God's not the storm maker. God's not starving people and killing people. But see, what's the mentality of the body of Christ? God's doing everything. God's in control. Well, if God's in control and there's children that are going through what they're going through and women and different people going through what they're going through and my God has the control to stop that and he's sitting back just saying, let's just watch. That is not the God of the Bible. The thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. But that's the mentality in the body of Christ. God's out doing the good and God's out doing the bad. That is such garbage. And man, did I have scowls during that sermon. I'm not saying that's what all Baptists believe. I'm just saying this was the Baptist church I was preaching in. And man, they had the mentality that God's in charge of the good, God's in charge of the bad, because God's in charge of everything down here. And oh man, they scowled me out of that place. They did. I was never asked back. <laughs> never asked back. Go with me to Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Oh, God, just bless me. Oh, God, just bless me. That's not how it works. You better, you better get to know what the Word says to do and do the Word. Now, I'm not even going to go there today, but while you're turning, you remember over there in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus said that the person that, that, that builds his house on the rock, he said the, he said the person that hears my Word and does my Word is like the person that when they're building a building, they build on a, found, a good foundation. He says when storms come and the waves come and the winds beat against the house and, and, and hit against it, he says that house stands. But then he said, the person that hears the word and doesn't do the word shall be likened to someone that built their house on the sand. You can look this up, Matthew 7. He said, the wind comes, the rain comes, the floods come, it beats against the house, but the, the house fell and great was the fall of it. What's he saying there in Matthew 7? It's up to you if your house stands or falls. If you do the word, it'll stand. You don't do the word, it'll fall. Your choice! Amen. Amen. I know this is foreign to a lot of people and their mentality. But this is how you get out of that religious mentality into doing what God has said to do. Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you. He says, I'm giving this to you. You know, natural, in the natural realm, this would make total sense to us. If I hand you the deed, or I should say the, the, the title to my truck, and I sign that over to you, I give that to you, is the truck any longer my responsibility? No. It's yours now, which means what? You can do with that truck whatever you want, and I legally have no say. You can have that, sign over the DMV, D, DMV and get everything done over there, and, and leave that place, and it's yours, and you could go out and you could scratch it up. You could go out and track mud through that thing. You could, you could spill milkshakes all over it. You know, I got to tell you a story. This is what you get for having Taco Bell at 10 in the morning because that should be a sin. But I love that place. And they serve tacos at like 8 in the morning there. So I thought, 10, that's pretty good, you know. I went there. I was just having that hunger for it. Went and got Taco Bell. And I got a big Pepsi with it. And I'm eating it in my truck. And I'm so excited to reach in that bag. I slapped that cup. And that pop went flying. And it hit. And the top went flying off. And I had Pepsi. Sticky Pepsi all over in different crevices and cracks of my truck. Oh, it was terrible. If you know what a clean freak I am about stuff. But you could do that with a truck that I give you and throw stuff all over it. And I have no recourse. Well, here he's saying, I give it to you. What's it mean? It's in your responsibility now. I give unto you 
Now, if you look up this word power in the Greek, it's the Greek word translated exousia. And if you look that up in other places in the Bible and in that word, it actually means authority. He says, Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. That word power there, if you look it up in the Greek, is the word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite, and that does mean power. But he's saying, Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now think about this for a second. The Bible clearly tells us that we have an adversary, we have an opponent. And we have an adversary and an opponent that doesn't want to just stub our toes. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy from us. In fact, the Bible says that he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, not to get too graphic here, but have you ever watched National Geographic and watched a lion take down a, a gazelle? It's not pretty. It's not sweet. It's not fun to look at and be like, wow, look how, look how beautiful that is as guts are flying and... <laughs> The lion is devouring. And the Bible says that the enemy goes about like a lion, attempting to devour. He wants your children. He wants you. He wants your body. He wants your money. He wants your mind. He wants it all. Now think about that. God knows that's our opponent. And you know what if you study in the Bible? There's not one place in the New Testament where the Bible says that God's going to do one single thing about the devil for you? Seriously, Pastor Mike, not one place. In fact, we could go to about four or five different places, this being one of them, where God told us that we have to do something about the devil. Well, look at it there. He's saying, I'm not going to do anything about the devil for you. I give you the authority to do it. What's it say in James chapter 4? It says, submit to God. It's talking to people. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Well, it's not telling God to resist the devil. It's telling you to resist the devil. In Ephesians 4 and verse 27, again, it's written to Christians. You know what it says? Don't give place to the devil. He's telling us to do something about the devil. Well, there's another more proof to you that even with the devil, the nasty devil, we can, God, the devil's after me. Do something about him. And God's going to say, you do something about him. I'm not doing anything. I gave you the authority. Glory to God. Go on and on and on. But I, I said all that to go to here. Go to James chapter 3. James chapter 3 and verse 2. We've been talking about words and what the Bible says about words and how they're seeds. And the way that we plant for our future harvest is with our words. We saw it last week. That when God wanted change, how did he do it? With his words. When Jesus wanted change, what did he do? His words. When the Bible says we want change, what does the Bible tell us? Imitate God and be like Jesus. Use our words. And so we're trying to hammer this home to you. But see, if you don't have the thing we talked about at the beginning of this service, that there's a man part and a God part, when I tell you about this part, it won't sink in. It won't be driven and it won't land like it needs to because it needs to land. Your future depends on this. Your children, your body, your money, everything depends on you getting this. Because whether you like it or not, seed time and harvest is always happening. You're always speaking, you're always putting forth seeds, and you're always getting harvest, whether you like it or not. Whether you like the harvest or don't like the harvest. James chapter 3 and verse 2, look what it says. For in many things we offend all. You know what that word offend means? It means to trip up or to stumble or to mess up. It says in many things we, we screw up. If any man offend or doesn't stumble, doesn't trip up, in word or how they speak, look what it says, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle, what's bridle mean? To control the whole body. Now let me read these, these verses to you in different translations. Sophie, I'm going to go to the Amplified, but you don't have to go there. You're welcome to if you want, but I'm going to start in the Amplified. It says, for we all often stumble and fall and offend in many things. And if anyone does not offend in speech, never says the wrong things, he is a fully developed character and a perfect man, able to control his whole body and curb his entire nature. Now listen to what it says in the Message, message Bible. Don't be in any... Oh, I'm going to go... Let's see, let me drop down here because I have verse 1 here. We get it wrong when we open our mouths... If you could find someone whose speech was perfectly true, you'd have a perfect person. Now listen to this. In perfect, don't forget this word, control. 
of life. What's the Bible saying there? Just like could bridle the whole body, saying, if you can get your words under control, it will control your whole life. Listen to what it says in the Passion Translation. We all fall in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control. There's that word control again. Control ourselves in every way. Wow. Wow. So the Bible stating to us here in verse 2, and it might be an eye-opener to us, that if we can get our words under control, we can get our life under control. Well, when we look back at previous messages, when God wanted change, and the change he wanted, what did he use? Words. When Jesus wanted change, to get change that he wanted, what did he use? Words. Amen. Now, I want, to, I want you to see something here. He tells us in verse 2, get your words under control, you can control everything. But then, he's so good to us, he goes on to the next two verses, and he gives us natural examples to illustrate this truth. In case you think, ah, oh, that can't be true. No, no, no. Wait till you see how true that it actually is. So in verse 2, he says, get your words under control, and you can control everything. He says, behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, which means what? To have control over them. And we turn their whole body. Now what you're going to see in these verses, there's two things that we're, we're trying to, to really bring to the forefront of the surface. Control and direction. Once you get control of something, you can take it whatever direction you want. And he's saying here, now just to let the cat out of the bag, in verse 5, he talks about the tongue and he likens the tongue to the bit. And he likens the tongue to the next thing we're going to look at, which is the steering wheel of a ship. But look what he's saying about the bit. He's saying the bit in the horse's mouth, what's it do? It gets, gives the rider control and also gives the rider control of the direction that the horse is going to go. Okay? And oh, Reverend Julie has a story about the bit. You've heard it here several times. One time, Reverend Julie decided to get on a horse and take off without the bit in the horse's mouth. Well, had no control, thought she had control, but learned she didn't have control. Didn't have control where the direction that horse went, and that horse took off running towards the fence, didn't it? Well, she saw that's the wrong direction, couldn't get that horse under control, couldn't get that horse turned, no bit in the horse's mouth. That's what the Bible says the bit's for. And horse ran her right into the fence, and guess what she fell into? The horse trough. With an F. I found out it's not th. I thought it was horse trough, but it's th. Horse trough. And you had bruises all over your body, didn't you? I mean, you, you could have been killed. It could have been a lot worse. And I always ask her this question. If the horse had a bit in its mouth, would that have been a different situation? Completely different, right? You would have been able to control it. Would you have been able to stop the horse? Would you have been able to turn the horse from the fence? Absolutely. The Bible's telling us, and we're going to get to it in verse 5, that our tongue, which produces words, is like the bit in the horse's mouth. What does the bit in the horse's mouth do? It controls that thing and lets you be in charge of whatever direction it's going to go. And remember what it said in verse 2, get our mouth under control, we can control our whole life. What does that mean? We can control our life and send it in whatever direction we want. You need prosperity, why don't you send it down that direction? You need healing, why don't you send your life down that way? Now, he's not done yet. Now, he says in verse 4, he's going to just he's trying to really get it, get it across to you. He says, behold, or look at the ships, which though they be so great. What's that mean? They're big. They're, they're a lot of, lot of pounds. They're huge. And are driven of fierce winds. What's that mean? These ships that are huge get put out on bodies of water. And at times, winds just absolutely blow to push that boat and to move that boat. Strong, heavy winds. Hurricane-type winds. Strong winds blow. He says, behold the ships, even though they're so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they're turned. Well, when you can turn something, if you're turning it, that means you have control. How do you get control of the ship? And when the winds are coming out of the west, I don't know if that's west, but we're saying it's west today, coming out of the west, blowing you this way, but you need to go west, 
and the winds are blowing this way, you know what you do? You take the helm or the steering wheel and you turn it that way. And that helm, that steering wheel will turn that whole ship and send it where it needs to go. It says, even though they're great and driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned with a very small helm wheresoever the governor or the captain desires to go. Words, what? Control our whole life. The bit in the horse's mouth is an example that you want control and direction? The bit. You want control and direction of the ship? Grab a hold of that steering wheel. And then look what it says in verse 5. Even so the tongue, what's he saying? The tongue is like the bit, the tongue is like the helm or the, the steering wheel. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. What's he saying to us here? You want control of your life? You want to direct your life where you're going to go? You saw my slick text yesterday. And it was pretty witty what we're talking about if, I'm, if I do say so myself. You know the song, Jesus, take the wheel. And that's what most Christians are doing, right? And it's sweet and it's got a catchy thing and, and, and we like the person that sings it and it sounds so good. It's so not scriptural. What's that mean when I'm headed into poverty, when I'm headed into depression and destruction and sickness in my life? Jesus, just take the wheel. And Jesus said, no, you take the wheel. You take the wheel. Where your life goes is not dependent upon me. I've already said it's finished. It's all available to you. It's so wrong and backwards. Jesus, take the wheel. No, 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 no. The Bible says the wheel is our mouth. My kids are over in, in children's church today with court. But I used to take them on the lawnmower, you know, and look really weird with Caleb on it with me now, but... I still would take Abby. I was walking into Wegmans last night with Abby holding her hand. I said, I said to her, I said, how long are you going to let me hold, hold your hand, Abby? She said, forever, Daddy. I said, done. <laughs> done. And then I started saying, man, I said out loud, look at this pretty girl. I get to walk in Wegmans. Dad, stop. There's people there. <laughs> but, you know, I'd still ride a lawnmower with her, but Caleb probably not so much, you know. That, it's, it's already feels awkward to be on a four-wheeler with him, you know. It's like, get off. You're walking. I don't, <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing this anymore. Those days are over. But anyways, we're on the lawnmower, you know. I get done mowing, raise up the deck, turn off the blade when they're three, four years old. Get on there, sit, sit in my lap, and they get, get the wheel. You know, when we're out in the, the wide open, no trees, no buildings around, no road, I'm not really, you know, I, I have my foot on the gas, you know, but they can turn it, whatever they want to do. But, but I'll tell you what, when we get near a house, we get near the road, we get near people, I'm understanding whoever's got the wheel has got the control. Whoever's got the wheel determines the direction we go. And so when we get around, my hands will come around onto their hand and they still think they're driving, but really, all of a sudden they get a sharp turn. It's like, you know, just to, because we're about to hit something. The control for your life, the steering wheel of your life is your tongue. It's just like the bit, just like the horse guru here told us. If the bit is in the horse's mouth, it can control the direction it can control and, and make that horse obey you. The steering wheel. If you just, how many times have you seen stories of little kids getting in a vehicle and then taking the wheel and they're not good at controlling? Well, they got control. They got direction. It's going to go wherever they turn that wheel. Ladies and gentlemen, your life, I can't stress it anymore, has everything to do with your words. Your words are, where, are the directions in which we go to. Uh, go with me to real quick before we close. A couple more places. Numbers 14 and verse 27. See, I understand the Jesus take the wheel mentality of being like, Lord, I need you. I, I just, I'm asking for your help. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you know how God's going to help you? Through his word. And you know what you're going to have to do? Do something. You know what God's going to tell the broke person? First thing he's going to tell them, start doing the right thing with your money. Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. You know what God's going to tell the person that's in doubt and unbelief? You need to get in faith. You know what God's going to tell the person that's walking out of love and that's why sickness and disease is coming? He's going to say, walk in love, forgive that person. He's always going to tell you what to do. Amen. He's always going to tell you how to, you know, remember when Jesus prayed for Peter? Jesus said, Peter, the devil desires to have you to sift you as wheat. He says, I've prayed for you. 
Now we would think, the religion would think, I've prayed for you to get that devil off your back. I'd pray for the devil to get away from you. No, that's not what Jesus prayed for, the Peter, for Peter because Jesus can't do anything about the devil for you. He said, I pray for you, Peter, that your faith, your faith would fail not. What's he saying to Peter? Peter, you want to be victorious in this? I'll pray, but that your faith works. You've got to make sure you're in faith. I can't do it for you. Numbers 14 and verse 27. This is the children of Israel come out of Egypt, seeing miracles, signs and wonders. God's trying to get them into the promised land. They come up against opposition in the promised land. And they're complaining. Remember, oh, we should just stayed in Egypt as sla slaves. We should have just died in the wilderness. This is terrible. And verse 27 says, How long, God is saying, shall I bear with this evil congregation which complains against me? I have heard, I have heard the murmurings, the words. And you know what they were saying? We can't get in there. We can't have that. We're going to die in the wilderness. It'd be better if we die. They said it. Well, what do we know in the New Testament? The wheel is our mouth. And look at what the Lord says in verse 28. Say unto them, as truly as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken. Bit steering wheel. As you whatsoever you bind. How do we bind with our words? How do we loose with our words? Jesus said, we will have whatever we say. As you have spoken in my ears. What's God saying? You did this. I didn't do this. As you have spoken in my ears, so I do to you. Or you could say this way, so will be. And what did they do? They fell in the wilderness. They wandered. They didn't get into the promised land, that generation. And they missed out. So you know what vice versa would have been like? If they would have all got on board and said, we can do it. Even though it's impossible. God, we know you're bigger. And use their faith. It would have been a completely different testament. And God said, as you have spoken in my ears, let's do this. Yeah. How your life turns out. Way more to do with you than it does God. What are you going to do with the steering wheel? Some of you have been driving right down Poverty Lane. In Sickness Alley. You know how you've been driving down that way? I'm always broke. I never have enough money. We can't pay our bills. We're always struggling. Just keep on driving. That's what you'll have. That's what your words are saying. My body hurts so bad. I'm always sick. I'm going to have to take this medicine forever. Why does it have to be like this for me? Grumbling, driving right down, discouragement lane, all those places. Why? You're in control where you go. If the, if the, if the, the captain wants the boat to go somewhere different, the captain's going to turn the wheel a different place. If the rider on the horse with the bit in the horse's mouth, and I don't know how to work the horses and which way to go, but I know they do things with reins and it does something in the mouth and the horse obeys. They don't like the direction the horse is going. The rider does something to turn that horse, stop that horse, make that horse go wherever he wants to go. You don't like where your life's going? You don't like the, 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 the direction you've been headed? Let's make a turn. And we'll, we'll close with this. Go to Proverbs 18 and verse 20. Proverbs 18 and verse 20. Aren't you so glad you can turn it? You can turn it, praise God. He said that. We turn their bodies. We turn the ship. You're going down in poverty. You've been going down there your whole life with years and years of this. That's okay. Make a turn. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 20. You know, I, was, uh, I had a friend growing up. She was a, a, a girl that, that I became really close with. It was Pastor Tim and her. We were like three musketeers running around and... Uh, I was actually the maid of honor in her wedding, and uh, I was qualified. I, I didn't have to wear the dress. These calves with a dress and high heels would just be such a turn off. I would not make a good looking woman. And uh, anyways, I wore a tuxedo. I was the maid of honor in her wedding. The best thing ever was the bachelorette party because I was the only guy there. That was, that was fun back then, you know, especially when I wasn't saved. <laughs> Just, you know, the thoughts you get and stuff. But anyways, um, so we got out of high school and we're all excited to go to college together. We're going to go to Pitt, Pitt Bradford and I'm going to play baseball there maybe. And she's going to look at the soccer team. So we get at Jamestown. You know, Bob, 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 Bob Evans there. You get on, it's 86 now. I think it was 17 back then. And, you know, you go east. 
go towards Olean, you get to, to Pitt Bradford. Well, I didn't really realize all that. I, the only way I ever knew to go on 86 was west to go to Erie for school shopping, you know, or Waldemere Park. So we're going, both of us, you know, in our bliss, and we're excited, and we're singing songs, and talking about, you know, being nervous about who we're meeting today, and our future, we're out of high school now, and all of a sudden I see the exit for Peach Street, which I know that's the exit you get off to go shopping, all the main, main shops on there, and I thought, all the years, and we're, and we're past the time it's supposed to take to get there, I'm like, all the years I've been here, I've never seen a sign for Pitt Bradford, come to think of it. And she looked, we looked at each other, and, you know, it's back when you print out directions. And it's like, which way are we going? Going west. Oh, Pitt Bradford at the Jamestown, you're supposed to go east to get there. Well, here's the thing about it. Going this way, going this way. Opposite directions. You know what fixed it? Stopped and turned the wheel a different way. Turn and went back there. Now, it didn't happen automatically, and it didn't happen quicker, and it took me a little longer but I kept setting the course in the right direction. And guess what? We got there. And we'll close with this. Proverbs 18 and verse 20. East and west, opposite ends of the spectrum. I want to show you opposite ends of the spectrum here. A man's belly shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. Do you see that there? Your satisf satisfaction comes from what you say and planting seeds for the right harvest. And then look at this. And with the increase of his lips, not Jesus' lips, your lips, he is filled. Filled with what? Filled with all the good things you need. Because then it goes on to tell us in verse 21 a principle that you better get a hold of today. Because again, whether you like it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, it's the word of God. And he says seed time and harvest will always be here. And you're, every time you open your mouth, you're sowing a seed. You are. Oh, my kids are such idiots. Seed in them. My kids never do the right thing. That's a seed into them. My kids are failures. What an idiot. What a moron. Oh, seeds. I don't make enough money. I never have enough money. Seed for a harvest that you don't want. Because you'll have what you say. Keep talking about how much money you don't have and you'll keep living in that. We talked about that last week. Death, verse 21. Death and life. What are we talking about? Opposite ends of the spectrum. Just like east and west, opposite ends of the spectrum, going in two different directions. Head and west, supposed to be going east. Well, death, what's death? Death is destruction and ruin. Death and life, look at this, are in the power or the ability of the what? Tongue. Why? Because the tongue can have control of your whole life. What's it saying? The tongue has the ability to produce death or life into your life by the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The fruit thereof what? The words you speak. The words you speak turn into harvests of fruit. Death or life. Amen? Now here's the good news. You recognize today, holy cow. I have been just cruising down death's highway and poverty's highway and sickness highway and discouragement highway. And I've been going full speed that way. Make the turn. When the horse is going, it uses the bit, just turn the thing. When the wind's blowing against it and the opposition's coming against us in life, just turn the wheel. Just turn the wheel this morning towards life. What does that look like and sound like? Glory to God, my money's increasing. Glory to God, you said in 3 John 2 that you wish above all things that I prosper. I thank you, prosperity's mine. What's that? Turning the wheel. I think increase in abundance and all my needs are going to be met. What are you doing? You're going down the road in the right way. You're setting it up for, for success. Turn the wheel on sickness and disease. Glory to God, the power of God's working in my body. Healing belongs to me. Sickness and disease has no place in me. All that's going wrong in my body will be made right and healing will be my, my end result. That's going in the right way. My kids are going to change. This is going to happen. My kids are going to be blessed. This person is going to be, uh, their mouths are going to be shut. Whoever's coming to get you, whatever it is, stop going down the death road. And stop begging God and looking at God like he's some idiot who's just aloof in your life and some deadbeat dad who doesn't want to help you. You have to take the wheel and then he'll back you with his power. Amen. Amen. Do you see it? It's as clear as day. Glory to God. And you know what's interesting about this death and life? Think about it. 
There's so many things in life uh, uh, that can produce good or bad, isn't there? Think about bleach. Bleach can be used for good, but bleach can be deadly too, can it, if you handle it wrong. Think about fire. Think about fire and the good things that can be used for fire. You don't do the right thing with fire, and what? It's death. Think about machinery. I'm thinking about a chainsaw. Man, a chainsaw is like one of my favorite tools to have in the woods with me. Don't go in the woods without a chainsaw. Uh, and, but if you do handle that chainsaw wrong, man, that could do some damage. Hey, man, what about vehicles? Vehicles can really be used for blessing, but if you don't do the right thing with vehicles, man, they can cause a lot of problems. And then what about electricity? We're, 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 we're benefiting from electricity right now, but if you do the wrong thing with electricity, it can lead to death. It can lead to hurt, amen? Same with your words. This can be used to produce life or death. Whether you acknowledge or not, it's true, and I can't stress it enough. I hope that you all take inventory of your life and start to say, okay, in this area of my life, I better start sowing a different type of seed. Amen. Harvests are coming regardless, but let's pray. Father, thank you for the word this morning. We, we're so grateful for it. Father, I know you spoke to all of our hearts, hit us right where we live. Father, you want to help people. You want to see your goodness come to pass. You told us, taste and see that you're good. You're not holding it back. But Father, you also said, we'll have what we say. We have to steer the wheel towards those blessings. And so I pray for each person that their eyes would be open to this. Father, that they would have a revelation. Their minds would be renewed to this. Father, that they would put a guard over their mouth. And that they would make that turn. And then not put the vehicle in neutral. Once they make the turn, put that vehicle in drive towards the good thing. Start speaking the right way. And it'll come to pass because Jesus, you said, we will have what we say. It's not a matter of if. No, you said we would. If we'll say it right, we'll have it right. So I thank you for that today, this morning, for that, for that word this morning. Now, if I could ask a favor of everybody to bow your heads and to close your eyes. I'm not trying to be bossy. Huh. But I want everybody to be comfortable for this part and blessed during this part. So if I could ask everybody to bow your heads and to close your eyes, please. And I'm going to address the people in this room, but also the people that are watching right now. I want to give each and every one of you a chance to go to heaven. Now, I don't know your background. I don't know what church has told you, what families told you, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that if you believe on Jesus, you will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, notice he didn't say anything about church attendance. He didn't say anything about if you're good enough. He didn't say anything about your morality. And also, he didn't say that lack of church attendance will keep you out or lack of morality would keep you out, any of that stuff. I know that's what the world teaches. I'm not trying to make you a member of this church. If you never step foot in this church again, that's okay. I want to see in heaven someday. And church isn't how you get to heaven, but through believing and receiving Jesus, it is. I showed you a verse that said, if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It is that simple. It is that simple. There's no religious hoops or cartwheels or anything you have to do to get God to love you. It's that simple. You could go to heaven and never step foot in church again if you do the right thing today. Now, church is good. I'm a pastor, and there's things in the Bible that, that will help us with church and why we should go to church. But when it comes to heaven alone, that is not a requirement. And so if you're here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, and you say, Pastor Mike, if my life ended today, or if Jesus came back today, I'm not 100% sure that I'd go to heaven. Well, see, if I ask myself, if Jesus came today or if I died today, would I go to heaven? I'm certain there's not even a, a shadow of a doubt. There's not even a question. And it's because of what the Bible says, not because of what I think, but because of what the Bible says. I did the right thing. I, I believed in Jesus. I received him. I asked him to come into my life. If you're here and you can say, Pastor Mike, I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, I want to tell you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to have you come to the front. I won't have you stand up, and I won't have you say anything on your own. In fact, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As I'm looking around, everybody's head is bowed and eyes are closed. If you want to receive Jesus here this morning and know that you know that you know that you're going to heaven, with heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, would you lift your hand high in the air? I'll have you put it right back down. Anybody want to receive Jesus before we close? I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you for your boldness. 
Anybody else want to receive Jesus? See that nobody's trying to, I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you for your boldness. See, we're not trying to embarrass anybody. I just don't want anybody to miss out on this. And, and the world teaches it's so hard, but it's not. It's so easy. God is so loving. Is there anybody else before we close? You can say, Pastor, I've never done this. Now that a few hands have been raised and I see that, you know, you're not going to call anybody out or embarrass them. I want to get involved. Is anybody else before we close that's never received Jesus and you want to receive Jesus, lift your hand high in the air. Anybody else? Father, we had two hands. Thank you so much, Lord, for it. Now, for those that are watching online, whether it's now or when this service is posted in the future, I know I can't see your hand, but it's okay. The Bible doesn't say anything about having to raise your hand to get saved. And for those that are here, if you did need to, need, need to raise your hand, but you said, I'm not comfortable doing that, that's okay. You can still get involved in this. The Bible says about believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. It doesn't say anything about raising your hand. I do that for my sake and to know what direction to go. And so for those people that raised their hand, those that should have raised their hand but you didn't, and those watching online, you want to get involved in this, what we're going to do in a second is we're going to pray a prayer. But your voice isn't the only one that's going to be heard. We're going to ask the whole church to pray it with you. And the contents of that prayer are going to be declaring that Jesus is real and that we believe in him and asking him into our life. And that's all the Bible says that you have to do to be saved. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, those people that raised their hand, those that should have, those watching online that need this, along with everybody else in the church, lift your voice and repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose again. And I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for eternal life. Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. You can look up here. Glory to God. I'll tell you what, if you prayed that for the first time, you know, it's important. If you prayed that for the first time online, please avail yourself to that email. Uh, call me, let me know. I want to show you in the Bible that it really is that simple. But real quick, I just want to tell you what the next step is. Because once you get saved, you become a child of God. And you're, you're heaven bound. Whether or not you step foot in this church, any church ever again, if you believed it and meant it, God believed it and he meant it as well and he saved you. But once you're saved, you become a child of God. And God is not a deadbeat dad. God doesn't take you into his family and then just give up on you. But one of the things I always tell people, you want your life to change radically and, and tremendously, do three things. Number one, get born again, get saved, receive Jesus. We just took care of that. The second thing to do is I talked about it in the service earlier was what? Find a pastor. Because without a pastor, you can't learn the way that you're supposed to. And that anointing is there to help you. Yes, you can have a relationship with God by yourself at home and with the Bible. But there's an anointing on the pastor. The things I've learned, I didn't learn by myself. The things many of these people here today that are walking in those blessings, they didn't get there on their own. A shepherd helped them. Well, it's the same thing. If, if you want this to be your church, I'd love to be your pastor. But go where your heart's telling you. Go where you feel like I'm hearing the word of God. I'm being blessed. And plant there. And hear the word of God. So three things to be in blessed. One, be saved. Two, find a church plan in it. And three, do the word you're taught. Yeah. And you won't even believe what your life can turn into and be because then you're doing it God's way. And again, love to be your pastor if, if you feel that's in your heart. And for those watching online, uh, same thing. You know, even though I've never met you, would love to, love to get to know you. Come to church. There's so many blessings for it. But praise God. Let's stand to our feet. And let's just worship him before we go. Father, we love you so much. Come on and give him glory. Give him praise. We're going the right direction, Father. We're going the right direction. We praise you. Now, in a second, I'm going to dismiss service. But before we go here, I just want to mention, don't forget, next Sunday is our Easter service. And then also, uh, if you need prayer, come on up. Uh, and I'll pray with you, lay hands on you like the Bible says, or just agree in prayer uh, after service. But uh, if, not, if none of that applies to you, have a wonderful rest of your day. Let's just thank him as we go out. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, everybody shouted. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Glory to God.